Plants are all around us. One of the interesting things about the fact that plants are all around us is that it gives us the opportunity to see lots of diversity. And diversity is a, uh, uh, for some people it's a scary thing, for other people it's a fascinating thing. When you, when you go into a culture, you'll find that there are some people who really know a lot about the diversity of plants and animals and other kinds of things around them. And they have really intricate classification systems for these. They can tell you the name of each variety of a plant. Sometimes even individual plants have names. Uh, names are really important. If you think about it, uh, within our own society, each of us can name hundreds of individuals that we know. You think about your friends, your relatives, each of them has a name, and you can consistently identify them and assign that name to them. Well, it turns out that in many societies, this is true for lots of other kinds of organisms, for plants, for animals, as well as people. And so one of the things that would be really helpful, beneficial to you as a student, is to be able to learn the names of plants and to think of them kind of as your friends, if you will. Um, and once you get to know plants on that level, kind of a first name basis, then you'll start to see that not only are plants all around you, but that there are these friends that have lots of interesting characteristics um, and that can teach you things about the world and that you can interact with in ways that you might not have thought about before. Traditional or folk taxonomy is our focus today. Traditional taxonomic groupings of plants and plant names have been assigned uh, in different cultures in different ways. However, the patterns that we see uh, make a lot of sense. Now, what occurs is that what makes sense in one community and what works for the way that they earn their living may not necessarily make sense in another community. Uh, to, to give a somewhat of an example, uh, people who live in a farming community oftentimes have lots of names assigned to varieties of the kinds of plants that are most important to them. And so we expect to see them have a lot of names for food plants at the varietal level and that these plants will be cultivated plants. On the other hand, if we're dealing with people who live in a, uh, a society where they use lots of ornamental plants, they may have lots of names for different ornamental varieties, and they may focus on that. Maybe food plants aren't as important to them, or maybe they're removed from food production, so they don't need to know the names of varieties. Alternatively, we might be in a society of hunter-gatherers, where they roam over a large area of land, and they might actually group together uh, plants that have similar characteristics under a single name, uh, plants that we would call as scientists several different species or maybe even different genera of plants, but they would assign one name because they have one commonality to them. Maybe they grow in the same environment or they have the same usage, they can be eaten for the same thing, you know, who knows what it is. Uh, but there's a lot of reasons why they're grouped and the big point of this is that the patterns of naming of plants make sense. They're not arbitrary. One of the second characteristics of uh, traditional or folk taxonomy is that all human cultures assign names in these kinds of patterns. It's not just some, it's all. Now, the problem with this is that we look at our own society and we say, wow, well, I don't know a whole lot of plant names, or you know, my cousin Eddie doesn't know a lot of plant names, therefore how can you say all cultures? Well, the simple fact is, is that not all people in all cultures uh, assign these kinds of names. Um, and in fact, many people are not involved in the naming process. All they are doing is they learned a particular set of names, and as much as those are useful to them, they retain them and pass them on to the next generation. And so, uh, it, it's kind of a specialized deal to be part of the membership of a society that is actually assigning new names to things. In our society, this tends to be relegated to uh, different kinds of scientists, uh, particularly horticulturalists who name lots of new, new plants. Um, but that's not necessarily the same in other cultures. Uh, 
It could be a healer who's learning new uses and therefore assigning new names to plants. It could be a farmer who's identifying new diversity and therefore naming new plants. Lots of different kinds of people could be involved in it. When, when we consider the, the fact that there are sensible patterns of names and that uh, these arise in many different cultures, uh, we can start to analyze the patterns. And as we consider the different patterns of namings that occur in, across cultures, we start to have insights into those cultures and the ways that they think about the world. What are their perspectives on the universe? A lot of times this is played out in the ways that they go about naming things. If they talk about plants as part of their community, if they talk about plants as being alien to their community. Um, sometimes we learn something about people's history. They may have plants that are named after a place they used to live, or they may have plants that are named after a place they hope to live someday. There's lots of different reasons why you name something uh, a particular name. There's also reasons why you group things together. So we don't just have names for plants, but we also have names for uh, groups of plants. So for instance, we think of the group grass. There's lots of different kinds of grass. Uh, even the average person realizes that there's many different species or kinds of grass, and yet we still have the word grass. For many scientists, the actual naming of organisms is considered to be the beginning point for the scientific discipline. One of the people who's pointed out as being the first ethnobotanist happens to be a scientist who's illustrated on the, in the image that you can see on the screen now. He conducted his research in the Arctic working with reindeer herders and he learned many kinds of traditional skills that they practiced. He, he learned how they hunted, he learned how they herded, he learned how they gathered medicines and gathered foods. Um, and within his work, he had a broad focus. So he was primarily studying the economic plants that were used. This included their uh, usage in medicine because he was a physician by training. Uh, he was interested in the taxonomy, both from the, uh, the scientific study of, of organisms and he wanted to know about the traditional uh, taxonomic uh, divisions. One of the things that he realized with his work with these reindeer herders, or Sami as they're known, is that they had a combination of a naming for each plant that consisted of a noun that referred to a type of plant and an adjective that referred to a variety of that plant. And, and it was true for fish and other kinds of things in the environment as well. Um, and so what he did was he took this classification system that he learned from these reindeer herders and he applied it to uh, the scientific study of plants and animals. Uh, in addition, one of the things that marks this individual as the first ethnobotanist uh, is that he used a set of reproducible methods. It is possible to go through his field notebooks and determine not only who he talked to, but when he spoke with them, what kinds of questions he asked, how he went about gathering the data, and uh, it would be possible for somebody in the present day to repeat his kinds of research. Now, obviously the people he interviewed are long, long gone, uh, but it's still possible to do the kinds of work that he did again. And this is a set of reproducible methods. And this is what differentiates science from non-science, is the fact that uh, the work is reproducible and uh, uh, secondly, that it has uh, documentation. In his case, the documentation is that he brought back samples of plants and also samples of the kinds of things that people taught him about. So in the picture, you see him illustrated wearing a set of clothing that he got from the reindeer herders. It's their style of clothing, although he's wearing it. And, and this was a kind of artifact that he brought back as an example of their kinds of knowledge. Well, this particular gentleman, if you haven't figured it out by now, is uh, Carolus Linnaeus, who is best known for developing the scientific system of classification that we use in modern science. However, what makes it really interesting is that he didn't just come up with this system of nomenclature out of the blue. Rather, he learned it from an indigenous community in the northern part of his home country of Sweden. And so, all of the modern scientific classification system actually has its root in indigenous systems of classification of plants and animals in Sweden. Sometimes a term in society gets a bad name. And so the term that I'd like to discuss next is the term discrimination. 
All of us learn from a young age that to discriminate is a bad thing. If I discriminate against somebody, this is definitely a very bad thing and I shouldn't be doing it. However, what I want to get across to you today is that discrimination, although it can be a very bad thing, is actually at the very root of culture. It's a key to survival. It's one of the biggest things that humans have the ability to do. And this is what I want you to think about. Just for a moment, imagine that you were some uh, distant ancestor of ours uh, back living in the savanna of Africa. And you can't tell the difference between a gazelle that you might want to eat and a lion that might want to eat you. If you can't discriminate between those two, you might not have given birth to children and they might not have gone on to become our ancestors. So the ability to discriminate at that level is really important. It's really important for plants too. Behind me you can see kind of a green blur of lots of different species of plants. Well, some of these are edible, some of these are poisonous, some of these are useful as medicines, some of them are relatively useless, or at least I don't know the use of them. If I can't tell them apart, if I can't discriminate amongst them, then I can't take advantage of that usefulness. And so a big reason why classification systems for plants are important is because they allow us to tell and to reproducibly tell somebody else what is important, what's important to us, and what will be important to them. If I cannot tell my children what good food is, then they're in trouble, they're gonna starve. But if I can tell them and they can reproducibly find that food, then we're good to go. When we, when we discriminate amongst things, we're really doing three kinds of tasks. The first is, is that we assign names to things. So something that becomes important to us, maybe it's a food plant, say let's say corn. Um, we can use that word corn, and when I say it, probably everyone who's hearing this has had some image pop into their head. They pictured corn. Now we didn't all picture the same corn. I, I grew up in a part of the United States where we eat corn that looks quite a bit different than what many other people eat. Some people are gonna grow up in a place where they don't eat corn, and so they just kinda have a generic view of corn but probably everybody pictured something. And what this means is that that name has carried some meaning to you. And that's what this is all about. Likewise, we group things. And we group things that are similar in some way. Uh, so sometimes we may have a grouping that is several things that we say all of these have the same name. In other cases, we may group things at a higher level. We may say all of these things are similar in some way. Um, and so we give them some higher level name, even though as individuals they have different names. Thirdly, we make clusters and we create categories of similar things and we develop whole classification systems. When we discriminate among things and we assign names to them, we can do this in a couple of different ways. Uh, in some cases, a plant may be so unique, it's so different from all other plants, that we just give it a single name. In other cases, there may be several plants that we, we need to discriminate between because they have different uses or they grow in different places or they have some reason why we need to uh, distinguish amongst them, but they, they look a lot alike or they're used a lot alike, and so we assign two names to them. So we assign that noun and adjective that Linnaeus observed. And so we have different kinds of the same thing. And this is a binomial system. This is the primary system that scientists use. The, probably the biggest difference between the scientific system and uh, traditional classification systems in most societies is that scientists insist on always using a binomial, whereas in traditional classification systems, they involve a mix of binomials for things that are closely related to each other in some way, and it may not be genetic relatedness, um, where they need to have a distinguishing characteristic um, and things that are quite unique and therefore can just use a mononomial. So here, here we see illustrated a set of four plants and we've assigned a name to each of them. We can next group these. So here you see plants one and two grouped together and plants three and four grouped together. This is referred to the taxonomy of the plant, this grouping activity. We can then make higher level classifications where we cluster uh, organisms together. So in this case you see that plants one and two are grouped together and that 
plants three and four are grouped together and that these two groups together form a larger group that is all of those plants. And you can imagine that this kind of system could get, go on and on and you could have many, many thousands of plants included within it. Uh, Dr. Brent Berlin has proposed a, a general system for ethnobiological classification. And within this, he has a set of general principles. The first of these is that there are uh, certain universal elements that are found in just about every language. Uh, this is disputed amongst anthropologists and linguists. Uh, however, for all practical purposes, this is pretty much true. Uh, and most of the dispute is over uh, subtle differences and details. Second, he notes that there are a set of ranks within each language, and that these include the level of kingdom, which is a high level. We could think of the term plant as being a kingdom level, and animal as being another kingdom level. Life form, such as tree or bush or vine. Um, a generic level term, which is usually the basic name of a plant. So it could be oak, or it could be uh, passion fruit, that kind of a thing. And then some kind of a subgeneric or specific level. This could be like red oak or the purple passion fruit. And oftentimes a variety level name. Um, and this varies a lot. So in some cultures, there are not very many varieties that are named. In others, there are lots of varieties that are named. Um, and at these three levels, or at these three lowest levels, the genera, the subgenera, or sp specific level, and the variety, there's a lot of variation between societies but they all seem to have the same general process. The third principle that Berlin notes is that there are certain kinds of knowledge holders, and these can be considered as uh, the generic level knowledge, which is held by most people, and it's held in common. So we would expect that the average person within a community would know this kind of knowledge. And then there is the subgeneric. This could be the specific or the varietal level information, and this tends to be the domain of knowledge that is held by kinds of experts, or what we might call traditional scientists, uh, people within a culture who function as the scientists for that culture. The fourth general principle that Berlin points out is that there, there tend to be higher order categories. These, these are not always the, the same levels, they're not always uh, parallel between different societies, and they're definitely not always parallel between any particular culture and the culture of science. Even scientists themselves argue about the higher level categories, but the simple fact is that there always are higher level categories. Finally, Berlin has a set of general considerations that he puts forward uh, that seem to not encompass all cultures, but that encompass clusters of cultures or types of cultures, oftentimes based on their lifestyle, maybe farming communities versus uh, hunting communities. We're not going to get into these for this course, but it's important that you realize that there are some other considerations that have been pointed out. Uh, if you're really interested in this, it's a good idea to pick up Berlin's book and read through it. When we consider the process of assigning names to things such as plants, there are several issues that uh, need to be considered. The first of these is the issue of recognizing patterns. And so it turns out that people in a wide range of cultures recognize the patterns of plants largely based upon the morphology of those plants or the shape. So it could be leaf size, it could be the, the size of the plant, whether it's a tree or a, a, a herb, um, it can be the color of the flowers and so forth. However, sometimes people use some unusual characteristics for, their, uh, for the patterns that they recognize. Uh, some examples of unusual ones are the, the way in which a machete glances off of a tree when it strikes the trunk. Uh, the smell of leaves when you crush them in your hand. Um, the taste of a root when you pull it up and bite into it or taste a small amount of it. There's some unusual ways uh, that, are, that are not that common, but the bottom line is that everybody uses patterns to recognize them. And so if you want to learn a particular classification system and really understand it, you need to learn to recognize the patterns that the people who develop the system are using. When we collect data on plant names, it's really important that we collect data from more than one person. So the, the easy thing that people will try to do is they'll go into a community and just find some person and walk around and have them point at each plant and say, what do you call this, and write down the name and they just leave assuming that that's the right name. 
Well, it turns out this issue of right names and wrong names is actually a big deal. Uh, you'd think it'd be easy, but it's not. Uh, and it's complicated for several reasons. The, the first of these is that there are variations in the way that people within any community assign names. Some people will use uh, two different names for the same plant because they learn them differently. They learn them from different traditions. In other cases, somebody may forget and give you the wrong answer. And this may be accidental or it may be intentional. Uh, but in either case, you know, double checking with somebody else would have helped you figure that out. So in collecting data on plant names and classification systems, it's really important that you gather information from a wide range of people within a particular community. However, the one caveat is that because we realize that there's differences in the knowledge between experts and non-experts within the community, sometimes it's a good idea to compare the information from experts with each other and compare the information from non-experts with each other. There's different types of knowledge that are held within plant names. So for instance, uh, sometimes a plant name tells you a particular location and the name of the plant might be different when it's planted in different locations. Sometimes there are culture specific patterns to names that are used. Another big issue uh, when we consider assigning of names is that there are different cognitive patterns that occur when people are discussing and organizing things. So for instance, uh, a, a simple example of this is that we, we think of the colors that we see around us as being fixed and that the assigning of names should be pretty easy. So we think, well, if I say something is yellow, somebody in another culture should have a word that roughly means yellow and we're talking about the same thing. But as it turns out, uh, although the spectrum of light that exists is a fixed thing and we can measure it, and the reflectance that we call colors is a fixed thing, it turns out that not everybody in every culture sorts colors the same way. So some people have relatively few colors and are more like me. I kind of grew up with eight crayons in my coloring box. And so everything to me is one of those basic eight colors. I don't recognize all these funny things like mauve and peach and that. These are something else. But for many people they recognize those funny colors and they have terms for them. Um, I just don't happen to be one of those people. And the same is true of cultures. Some cultures recognize a wide variety and, and might mix some things. So what we might call red and orange, somebody else might call all the same thing and lump it with brown. Although for us we can say, wow, those are distinct. But it may not be the same for them. The same is true when it comes to assigning names to plants. People will group together plants for one reason or another and call them by one name and it may not be the same uh, grouping that you find between cultures, uh, between the culture of science or between any other two cultures. And So uh, there's, there's a lot of kinds of variation and that's pretty important when we consider the naming of plants. There's some additional concerns when we think about how people in different societies assign names to, to things, particularly plants. One of them is that there's a non-arbitrariness to the assigning of names. And now this is not true of all names, but it's true of quite a few, and there's some different ways in which this is, can occur. So for instance, sometimes a plant is given a name that has something to do with a sound that it makes. So it could be that the, the plant uh, has leaves that make a shimmering sound in the wind and the name is somehow reflected of that or it sounds like that sound. Uh, you find this more often with animals where you may have a bird that its name sounds like the call that it makes uh, or another animal where its name sounds like the the noise that that animal normally makes. Uh, but we have the same kind of thing happen with plants. Um, and sometimes there are patterns to the uh, the terminology that's used. So people will consistently assign color names to a, a group of plants or they may consistently assign size names to a group of plants. Uh, but there, oftentimes there's a logical reason as to why you're assigning a name the way you are and it's not just kind of an arbitrary thing. There's also a substance and an evolutionary process that occurs to the kinds of categories that we use. To give an example, if we start to develop a category for a group of plants, it usually means that all of those plants have something in common that we recognize. And a lot of times this is some kind of usefulness. 
So we might have a name for all the plants that are used as medicine, for instance. And, and we just assign some kind of a name system where we have one plant that's used as medicine, uh, and then a second one gets added to the category. It's also used as medicine, and its name reflects that it's similar in some way, uh, particularly the, its medicinal usage, to the first one that we named. However, even though we find that there is substance to categories of knowledge, uh, it doesn't mean that all categories have a, a clear substance to them. So sometimes it appears that there's a bunch of things that are arbitrarily thrown together. And there's probably a lot of good reasons for this, but uh, one reason that I've been able to uh, understand by exploring some different languages is that it appears that at times people will develop a category that has a substantive meaning and everything that's within it makes sense together. However, they then subsequently move to a new environment or maybe they change the way that they're living their lives and that original meaning is now uh, vague or lost. And, and so you, you kind of lose track of the meaning behind it. Uh, a good example of this is the word in English, wart, which we see this assigned to quite a few old English common names, penny wart and uh, so forth. And, and at one time, this was a category. Wart basically meant plant. And there was a whole grouping of plants that all went under that category, and, often, and many times they were all used medicinally. Um, however, that, that commonality is really lost, but this word is retained as a piece of the name of quite a few uh, plants. Um, but certainly many of those plants have actually had their name change. So uh, that, that's an example of it being lost. And all of this is really part of the evolution. Um, the naming of plants is not a static thing. Somebody doesn't name a plant once and then that name sticks forever. Uh, and so names are changing for a lot of reasons. Uh, just the same as the rest of a language changes over time, uh, the naming of a plant will change over time as well. And the same holds true for the naming of a category. So a category itself might change, the, the, the name of the category might change, or the constituent members of that category might change over time. This slide illustrates an example of the complexity of traditional naming taxonomies. What you see illustrated is in the first column a scientific name for a plant family, the Myrtaceae. This is a group of plants that are collectively put together because they have similar kinds of flowers. And in fact this is the way that most flowering plants are grouped in the scientific classification system that was developed by Linnaeus. After the family, you see the list of genus and species. So this is the binomial name that scientists have assigned to a particular group of plants that they say all of these individuals, a particular group of individuals, are all the same species, and we give them all the same binomial name. In the third column, you have a, uh, a slightly different taxonomy, but it's equally valid, which is a Hawaiian taxonomic system uh, for roughly the same group of plants. And there's a good reason why I say roughly. Uh, and the reason for that is that the margins of the category, so some individuals, Hawaiians might put into one category and scientists might put into another, but most of the time these, tax, these groupings seem to line up. So the first category that we have, instead of a family listed, we have a form, which here we have kumu as the form. Next we have a generic and then a specific and a varietal level. And if you consider Berlin's categories, the generic, specific, and variety level actually tell us a fair amount about the kinds of people within a society who are likely to both know these names and use them for a practical purpose. So the specific and variety level information is most commonly used by experts. So it would be people who use these plants for some particular purpose. When we see a plant that only has a generic name, the usual assumption is that it either has very few uses uh, or that it's very distinctive and not easily confused with other plants that are similar to it. And so we can see examples of this throughout this list, uh, which consists of the plants of Hawaii that are in the scientifically recognized family Myrtaceae. So let's take a look at some examples of some of the plants that I've just been listing as names, because the names uh, probably aren't that helpful for many people. So the first one we have is, in Latin, Eugenia rhinewardiana. This is the plant that is 
most commonly known as ni oi in Hawaiian. And some people claim that this is the plant that is referenced as ni oi in a lot of the older Hawaiian discussions about a plant called ni oi. Uh, that's as opposed to a plant called ni oi that is the chili pepper. And so there's a lot of controversy around this. We don't want to get into it at this time. But just so you know, this is the plant uh, that is involved in that controversy with chili pepper. Next, we have several different species of Metrosideros, uh, particularly focusing on Metrosideros polymorpha. Uh, most of these are the group of trees that in Hawaiian are called Ohia lehua, uh, with various uh, varietal names following those to describe usually the color of the flowers. The third species we have is Syzygium malicense and Syzygium sandwichensis. And uh, these represent the group of species that in Hawaiian are known as Ohia ai and Ohia ha. Um, and with one of these being an introduced species that Polynesians brought with them from the South Pacific, and the other one being an endemic species that is found only in Hawaii. So if we look at these species in a, uh, a phylogeny, which is basically a genetic tree, and so this is showing relationships that are hypothesized by biologists, and these relationships are hypothesized based upon mor uh, morphological and genetic differences and similarities that are found across a range of species. And so what we see in this particular phylogeny, you can look at these uh, lines as being the branches in a family tree, we see six genera that are hypothesized as being related. And among these, three of them are entirely introduced to the Hawaiian Islands, this being Melaleuca, Eucalyptus, and Cidium, Cidium being the guavas. However, uh, three of these, Metrosideros, Eugenia, and Syzygium, are plants that the ancient Hawaiians would have had access to and would have been applying names to. And so when we look at the relationships that Hawaiians apply to these, we see that, first of all, all three of these, Metrosideros, Eugenia, and Syzygium, are all grouped together and are discussed together. Um, and in addition, the clustering of names across these is consistent with the kinds of information that would have been available in the Hawaiian species. Now, uh, probably, if Hawaiians had had access to Melaleuca, Eucalyptus, and Cidium, they would have had a more complex set of names being applied, and these names would have taken into account these other genera. Likewise, modern science may not have all of the genera that are involved, and therefore, uh, uh, this particular family tree could change if modern scientists had access to more genera than are in this tree. So let's, let's shift gears and look at a plant that's a little bit easier to think about. In this case, we're looking at Ava, or Piper methysticum. Uh, Ava is a plant that is asexually propagated, meaning that it's grown from cuttings, uh, usually of pieces of stem, um, although they can also be of roots. And in this case, these are being transplanted and grown asexually. There are no seeds being produced, and so there's no opportunities for kind of the normal patterns of evolution to occur. So what we have in the case of Ava is we have long lineages of clones that are being propagated by many, many generations of farmers. And over time, every once in a while, one of these clones will have a mutation occur, and this is referred to as a sport. And so a sport looks or tastes or smells or in some way is slightly different than the plant it came from. Other than that, it's genetically identical to the plant it came from. And so in this next diagram, what we have is this is a list of uh, 43 Hawaiian varieties of ava that were collected by Kavika Winter growing in the Hawaiian Islands in uh, 2000 and 2001. And he grew these all out in a common garden um, in an attempt to de determine uh, the traditional Hawaiian taxonomy and to try and correlate information that he was learning from growers and farmers in Hawaii about these plants and, and correlate their information with the information that the plants give when they're grown in the same garden. Um, and in the same way, he's ruling out variations that might occur due to farmers growing the plants in different kinds of environments.
what he found was that he had several clusters of plants that all grew and looked alike and were also named alike. And so therefore, these, this provided strong support that these were traditional names that made sense and related to genetic groupings of the plant as opposed to just referring to morphological groupings that were the result of interactions with the environment. So this particular uh, tree of relationships really shows a Hawaiian way of thinking about the world. And the groupings that are here show both Hawaiian names and the groupings upon which these names are based, which are uh, leaf characteristics and colors of the stem and whether there's stripes or spots on the stem. Similar kinds of groupings and clusters that happen, happen with coconuts. So new is the uh, ancient Pacific word for coconut. And if we go across the Pacific Islands, we typically find that there are two groupings of coconuts that people talk about. We have coconuts that are rather, uh, that have a rather small nut and not a lot of meat and not a lot of liquid, but they have large, long fibers that spread around the nut. And, and these coconut fruits also happen to float very well in the ocean. And then we have larger coconuts that have a very large uh, nut inside and tend to have lots of meat or have lots of juice inside. Um, and they tend to have relatively few fibers on the outside. And if you were to toss them in the ocean, they'd float for a while, but they don't float very long and they would then sink. Clearly there's a difference between these two groupings of coconuts. And we find this both in the traditional names of the coconuts and we find it in the uh, uh, genetic relationships that have been uncovered. So uh, this slide illustrates the Samoan names, New Kafa and New Vai, and it so happens that these are the same terms that scientists now use, uh, largely because some of the first scientists to work on the varieties of coconuts happen to typify them with Samoan varieties. One of the interesting things about coconuts is that in many parts of the Pacific and Indian Ocean regions, uh, they are associated with the coconut crab. Now, there's a fair amount of controversy here because some people say that coconut crabs don't need coconuts and that coconuts have nothing to do with coconut crabs. Uh, personally, I have seen coconut crabs up a coconut tree cutting coconuts and I have seen them eating them on the ground. Uh, I can assure you that coconut crabs have a lot to do with coconuts. However, coconuts do grow where there are no coconut crabs. For instance, in Hawaii, there are no coconut crabs, but surely we have coconuts. This map shows the distribution of coconut crabs. And what's very interesting is that this distribution is probably also the natural distribution of those coconuts that have a small nut and lots of fibers on the outside. The implication is that both the coconut crab and the large coconuts, or new kafa, are somehow related, that the crabs are distributed to the same places that the coconuts are. An implication of this is that these coconuts are naturally distributed without the aid of humans because we have little reason to believe that people move the coconut crabs around, um, although the coconuts are often implicated as being human distributed. This set of photographs illustrates some of the diversity of coconuts that's been collected in different locations. So on the left you see coconuts in a collection in Samoa. Uh, note the variation in size and shape of the coconuts. Each coconut variety will consistently have the same uh, size nuts with the same size uh, fruit inside. On the right we see a large collection of mature coconuts uh, at the International Germplasm Collection. Uh, each of these coconuts, as I said, is mature and so these do not represent kind of juveniles of different varieties. So each variety reproduces at the same size and all of this probably represents human selection of diversity uh, over time because coconuts are freely pollinating with each other and they're also self-pollinating. And so we have long lineages, somewhat similar to what we had with kava, that are producing these coconuts over time. This image illustrates a large family tree of coconuts from the International Germplasm Collection. And notice that there are four major groupings noted at the bottom. And these groupings really represent the genetic relationships amongst all of these coconuts. And, and this really represents the, the total diversity of coconuts around the world. It's divided into two groups. On the left, 
we have those new kapha, those big fibrous nets that are associated with the coconut crabs. And notice that they have their own lineage that's distinct from the coconuts on the right that are groups one through three. The groups on the right represent all the diversity created by people, probably created by people over the last 15,000 years or so. So people going out, finding a variety that's slightly different, intentionally planting that variety and propagating it over time, selecting again and again and again, creating lots of diversity. Every time you see a branch in this structure, it represents some ancient farmer making a decision and actively growing a new variety. And so one of the things to note here is note how many varieties are on the left in category four and how many varieties are on the right in categories one through three. People clearly have been much more effective at producing lots of varieties than has nature, which is what category four is presumed to be. So people have really picked out a lot of varieties of coconuts. And this is a very common phenomenon with humans. If we were to put the coconut categories into Berlin's taxonomy, what we would find is that at the, the most finely divided levels of the taxonomy, people have picked out and named lots of diversity. And this tells us that coconuts are really an important plant. So anytime you see lots of varieties, that coincides with it being really important in a society. If we saw very few varieties, we would say it's probably not that important. So I'd like to conclude this episode with some suggestions for some kinds of projects that people could do that relate to the understanding of taxonomy and classification systems. And it's particularly important to realize that these kinds of classification systems are used not by people just in traditional society somewhere. They're used by you and I on a daily basis. This is really where the rubber meets the road. This is a very common thing. People who walk into the grocery store and go in to buy apples, go in and buy a Granny Smith apple or a Fuji apple or something. And there is a binomial right there. So within the average grocery store, you can find a classification system that is consistent with what I've shown you in this presentation. So here's some projects. First of all, how about identifying a culture's taxonomy and classification system at the big level? How do people sort things? Do, uh, you could begin with the question of plants and animals. Ask somebody, how many different kinds of plants are there? Get them to put those into groups. How many different kinds of animals are there? Get them to put those into groups. Do they have a name that refers to things that are both plants and animals? You know, uh, what's the higher level groupings here? You could uh, conduct a study that compares two cultural systems. It's pretty easy to find uh, groups of people who represent different cultures. Uh, most of us live in communities that are diverse enough that we have at least two cultural groups present. Ask a group of people a set of questions that are specifically laid out, such as list all the plant foods you know and then ask the same question of a second group of people and then get them to put these into categories, grouping them and see if they come out with the same system or something that's very different. And the ways in which they're similar tells us something about the two cultures and the ways in which they're different tells us something. You could determine the patterns of naming and classifying plants uh, that are used in your own family or even yourself. You could sit down and just try to think through a list of everything that you know um, and then try to sort things into categories. You could ask your family and friends uh, about a category of plants to see what meanings they have for different kinds. For instance, when you give a particular kind of flower to somebody, what does that mean? And you could pick you know, uh, roses and uh, uh, tulips and lilies and then ask, you know, what does it mean when you give this particular kind of flower? Is there an implication? Uh, if I give a red rose, does that mean the same as if I give a yellow rose or a white one or a black one? What do each of these mean? And it's amazing how much information is carried within the classification system. It's much deeper than just the name. 